Friends, we remind ourselves today, we are, we are looking into the scriptures to understand better this God who is both infinite, so vast, and so large it's incalculable, and the creator and sustainer of all life and all things, but also a God who is intimate, a God who is intimately invested in your life, in my life, and the life of Christ being found and lived out by everybody in this world. Christ died to save them all. So this infinite creator sustainer is also intimately connected to those who, whom he loves, those who bear his image, us, humanity. And today we are going to turn ourselves towards um, a bit more of an intimate picture of maybe how God has created a construct that allows us to come together in a pretty natural, normal, daily way and, and it's a place that's familiar to us, but it's also a place that could be greatly used by the church because it's always been used by God and um, especially highlighted in the work of Christ. And the, the thing that is, is is the table. The table. The table is a central value in this church. It's, it's something that we believe speaks value into so many different things. So let me unpack this real quick. Have you ever been to someone's house and they set out a really beautiful table? And you're like, I could never do that. Anybody? Yeah. My grandma Cox, so my mom's mom, was raised in the Great Depression, and, um, and she was moved from Broken Bow, uh, Nebraska, which was her hometown, during the Dust Bowl. They migrated west. They ended up in the Grand Valley, Grand Junction, Colorado, where she and her, I believe, nine siblings lived in a house, and all the girls shared one bedroom. So girls, if you're complaining about your sleeping situation, my grandma would say, you shush. All right. Um, so, so she lived. They lived in this house down in the little Riverside neighborhood in Grand Junction, and uh, they were, as many were, dirt poor, dirt poor. Now, my grandmother married uh, my granddad, and my granddad had an eighth grade education. Went and fought in World War II. He came back, and he was an enterprising young man. Uh, he was he was kind of fun and awesome, and. Um, and they got married, and my granddad did well in business. He owned some car dealerships and national car rental. And my grandmother loved finer things. Anybody have a grandma like that? They give you a cookie, and it's on like a doily, and you're like, can I just have it on a hand? Like it's a little, you know, it's like everything's presented, you know. And that was my grandma. But she, she loved to, to set a good table. And when she was little, they only got meat one time a week. So when she did a Sunday dinner, she did a Sunday dinner. And it was awesome. And it was so good. And she would set the table. And she had China specifically ordered from Harrods in London, which apparently my granddad wasn't happy about because that was expensive. Her gravy boat was worth more than my first three cars. So my grandma loved to set things out and do it right. And um, I remember coming into her house, and two things at grandma's. It always smelled clean. The woman was fastidious with cleanliness. But it was, but you would walk in on a Sunday, and it was just like the smell would envelop you. Like the fatted calf was long since, you know, slaughtered, and we were about to dine. And it was potatoes and meat and, like, vegetables, and the table was laid beautifully. And even us kids who were a little bit feral, we didn't get to eat near the Herod's China because apparently I break stuff. But um, we got a table downstairs just down the, down the way a little bit from the dining room, and it was this round table, and all us grandkids would go down there, and she would set it out with the second best china, which we broke often, and it would always be nice. We had our own little butter dish, and everything was just so, and we had our napkins in a ring with our you know cottage cheese and a little peach half on it. It was grandma did it right. Right? It was good. I remember going there as a kid, and it just evokes such memory just to talk about it. The lady knew how to set a table so that when you walked in, you're like, oh, she was expecting me. She knew I was coming, and she killed something and cooked it. You know, but she didn't just do that. She made it a place of complete welcome. You wanted to be at the table. You wanted to be near it. In John chapter 6, we're going to explore a story, a couple of stories today, where Jesus Christ brings people to a table. He brings people to a place where they are going to receive something they didn't deserve and they couldn't have asked for. They wouldn't have known how to ask for it. So in John chapter 6, what we find is that Jesus' disciple, who would name himself his best friend. So John says that Jesus is his best friend. He says in his gospel that he's the one that Jesus loves, the disciple Jesus loves. So John was humble. And um, 
But John comes to us from this very intimate kind of angle, this friendship with Jesus, and um, he shares these two interesting moments, the first of which is where he feeds the 5,000 where he feeds 5,000 people, and it takes place in John 6, 1 to 14, and the story goes like this. Jesus goes out to a solitary place to get away a little bit, and when he gets out there, he looks, and the crowd is following him, 5,000 people. That's crazy, but that still happened. They go out, and they're out in the middle of nowhere, and Philip, one of the disciples, comes up to Jesus, and he's like, all these people came out here and there's nothing out here to eat. Like, what do we do? And Jesus looks at him, already, Jesus already had a plan, but he looks at him and he says, why don't you feed him? And Philip handles it just like you or I would. It would take six months wages for me to even buy them a bite of bread. Oh, mission lost. Like he was just de devastated. You can read the emotion in the scripture. Uh, we can't feed them, Jesus. There's so many, and we couldn't even buy a bite for everybody. What are we going to do? And what does Jesus do with this? He does a couple of things that are really interesting. First, he does the thing of you feed them. When that seems all lost, Jesus tells his disciples to set them up into groups so they sit down together. Now, in the Gospel of Luke, this is unpacked really clearly, but um, he has them sit down together in groupings. And obviously, someone went out into the crowd and said, do you have any food? Because all of a sudden, somebody shows up with a little kid's lunch. Five loaves, two fishes, right? Remember this story? Five loaves, two fishes, somebody comes up. Can you imagine being that kid, the one responsible child among 5,000 adults, and they yank your lunch? <laughs> Nobody else finds that? Well, I mean... Okay, maybe you guys were bullies. Um, but, they, like, can you see him standing there, like, can I have my lunch back? Like, he would have wanted his lunch back. And they're standing there, and they said, look, Jesus, all we have is these five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus says, okay, have them sit down. Have them sit down. And they would have sat down in these little groupings of people they walked out with. And Jesus raises up, and he blesses the food. He blesses the food and gives to them enough to eat that there was 12 baskets left over. He doesn't just say, okay, meal's over, go. They ate till they were satisfied, and then Jesus went and got all the leftovers. I want you to think with me. Have you ever eaten till you were satisfied? Yeah, Carson's like, yes, I have. Thank you, Carson, no matter what your mom did to your arm. All right, um, so, yeah, if you've, who here's ever been to Golden Corral? Have you eaten till you were satisfied? ashamed but satisfied. You're like, oh gosh, I should lay on my left side. Something's not right. You eat so much. They could eat all they want. All they want out of five loaves and two fishes. Out of five loaves and two fishes, they sat in circles and ate until they were satisfied. Jesus knows that they're there and they have been fed, right? He understands for them this moment and he feeds them. But the next day, they all come back out to the same wilderness place. And the, the, the kind of hint there is that they came back looking for food. And Jesus uses that moment to reveal something of himself. They came out expecting one thing and got a completely different thing the next day. And what's interesting to me in that is when Jesus reveals of himself on this second day something it's very uncomfortable for people. The best way to do it is to read it. So I'm going to read, follow along with me, John 6, 30 to 40. So they ask him, what sign will you give us that they may see it and that, that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Anybody ever feel awkward when kids hint, obviously? You know, like, boy, it's so hot, I just wish we could swim. Right? You know, and you're like, the pool's out back. You're like, I don't want to go in the pool right now. I'm just super hot. It's kind of scary, but I'll be fine. Right? They hint at it. That's what they're doing here. They're like, remember what happened in the desert with our ancestors? He gave them bread to eat, and <clears throat> we came out here hungry again. That's what he's doing. It's super awkward. So he gave them bread from heaven to eat, and Jesus turns this back and says, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of, um, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. <laughs> right? They're like, good, good, I'll have that. Surf and turf. Yes, 
They're, they're kind of ordering like, yes, yay, it sounds great. That's what we'd like to have. But look at what Jesus goes on to say to him. Then he declared, I am the bread of life. Well, we don't want to eat you. Can you imagine, like, we sanitize scripture in weird ways in the church, but can you imagine, yes, always give us that bread. We're super hungry. We didn't pack lunches. Hopefully one kid brought one because we're ready for it again. And Jesus is like, I'm that. Oh. The uncomfortableness of it. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hung- go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Remember last week, I thirst, never be thirsty. But as I told you, You have seen me and you still do not believe. All those the Father give me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Hold on to that for just a second. Just remember that I will never drive them away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, my Father, that I should lose none of all those that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. I will raise them up at the last day. A lot of people didn't take this well. A lot of people did not like what Jesus said because he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me hungry will never be hungry again. You will never go hungry and you will never thirst. And people feel really uncomfortable with this and they get kind of angry. I remember um, I had never noticed this scripture before until um, I believe it was my niece who was, we were blessing her on her 13th birthday, and my brother-in-law, Jeff, said, um, he said the scripture that Peter answers when the, the, it was right after this, and all his disciples left. It says in John chapter 6 that the disciples begin to depart from him. Many of him them left Jesus after this teaching and didn't follow anymore. And Jesus turns to his disciples, and this is, and he says, will you leave me too? And this is the phrase my brother-in-law spoke that like branded on my heart that day, is when Peter said back, Lord, where would we go? For in you we found the words of eternal life. Peter was caught between a rock and a hard place. Suddenly, Jesus wasn't popular to follow. Suddenly, people were departing in droves. And Jesus, who said, I will never drive them away, did leave people to believe what they wanted to believe, but he was going to reveal something true of God. And it made people uncomfortable in their lives. And that's tough. Because we as the church like to please people. But at dinner tables, at the tables of life, we can have difficult conversations. And Jesus had one with his disciples right here. Are you going to leave me too? And the answer came back, Lord, where would we go? Because what that reveals in Peter is, I've given it all. I mean, you are all I have. I have put all my chips in in life on you, Jesus Christ. Where would I go? You are the words of eternal life. That is one of those difficult conversations in an intimate setting. And what we have to do is recognize that when Jesus Christ says that he is the bread of life and no one will leave hungry, we have to ask a question. Why are we so hungry for the things of God? Why are we not satisfied and constantly kind of, oh, jonesing? Let me ask you a question. Back to the foundry. Have you ever wondered why we put out so much food out there? Anybody ever wonder that? No? Who's just thankful? Yeah, you're like, amen. So I'm shocked you don't wonder. I wonder sometimes because it's hard on my waistline. But um, you go back there and you see this lavish table. It's 120 dozen baked goods a week that we ask people to bake and bring in and we set it out. And then you put out Starbucks. Why the table? Why is it so lavish and why do we feed you every time you come? For Alpha, for Bible studies. Do you notice there's always food? There's always something to gather. Now you could say, well, it's because it's Eric and he has an eating problem. That's judgmental and true. Um, but, But why is it? It's because we believe that at the table, when you set a table, remember the image of my grandmother's table, and you walk in and you're received well, It speaks to your intrinsic value. You have value to God. And in sitting down together at the table and recognizing 
not only your value, but a number of, of other things that we can have difficult conversations and ask hard questions and engage in real life things in this sanctuary as well as in smaller groups. We recognize that at the table, we can do some things well, they speak these languages. They speak of generosity. Think of what Jesus did on that hillside. 5,000 people, have them sit down in groups. Have them sit down in groups. Have them gather at a table, right? They just sat down in little groups. And Jesus fed them. And they had these conversations because God was generous to them that day. They ate till they were satisfied, but they also were in groupings that allowed conversation to exist in the great mass of 5,000 people. The next thing Jesus did is this thing of effort speaking to value. And this is part of the foundry values, by the way, that we believe in generosity, being generous to, to a fault in receiving people well, and saying that our effort speaks of value. Jesus had a plan for this, this, this afternoon when people would need food. Jesus had a plan. And he had to make for them an effort. Go find somebody with food. If you can't feed them, get them into groups and get them sat down. Jesus made an effort to get things set up so that people could receive what God was going to do for them. And then Jesus is present with the people. But he's not, it's not He's present and perfect, but it's present, but it's not perfect in the sense they're out in the middle of a field. It's, they're not going to have this food all the time there, but, but Jesus is right there. He's with them. He sits down, and he eats with them. He's present in the meal. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and seen a family sitting at the, the table, and they're all sitting there like this, right? And you're like, oh, present often doesn't have, I just saw about five moms go, mm-hmm. Like, that was awesome. I literally, I wrote, that's awesome. You kids put your phones down. Um, but have you ever seen that? You see them looking at their phones, and they're not engaging in any kind of relationship, in anything that says I'm present. See, we like things to be perfect, so we'll work really hard to make it look good, but we can't be there and serve because, or we can't be there and really connect because we're holding up a perfect thing. What if we said, Having company makes a terrible mess, so we're going to be okay with the fact that there's going to be a mess for a while so that we can be present. You leave this church every Sunday, and it looks like a cookie bomb went off, and there's coffee stains, and we're like, yes, because we were present. We're just not perfect, and Jesus Christ sets that same thing. He did amazing things with what little they had. You don't have to have a ton to be present and not perfect. You simply have to give us the best, which is you and sharing your time and your talents with us. So let's just go and unpack real quick. What happened in this second story in John chapter 6 when they come back and they're treating Jesus a little bit like McDonald's? They've come back because they had been fed and they want more. They want more to eat, and they had been introduced to Jesus. Here's where we at the foundry recognize that sometimes by putting out so much food, by, by feeding and engaging well in this, we want to do what Jesus did. We want, to, we want people to not only feel comfortable, but to be introduced to Jesus Christ. Because our desire is not just to feed you baked goods until you need insulin. Our desire is to welcome you well so that one day we can bring you to the table that truly matters. We can find ourselves at the table that costs Jesus everything. And we can recognize that there is something real in the food we're eating here at the Lord's table at communion that satisfies into life and our present purpose, not only life here, but life eternal. We want to get people comfortable at the table so they come to the table and receive the grace of what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection means to you now. So we recognize this because we need real food. We don't need spiritual gymnastics. Religion is toxic, and it's like it causes you to act like you have it together, but you lose it. But when you get real food, it's satisfying. So, um, sorry, buddy, I got to use you in a story from when you were little. Um, so my son Josh was, was young, and he, he loves carbohydrates when he was a little guy. And um, we were at Panera Bread one day, and uh, we were eating, and Josh looked at Eric, and he said, can I have a cookie? And um, she, she kind of she got after him. She's like, 
you have eaten nothing of any nutritional value today. And kind of laid into him as a mom can awesomely do. And I was like, dude, you are in so much trouble. But then I was the same way. Um, so she kind of got after him. She's like, you know what? No, you haven't had any fruits or vegetables. I looked on his plate. And for some reason, a garnish that day at Panera was half a lemon. <laughs> and so I said, but if you eat the lemon, you can have a cookie. <laughs> and he's like, ew, I don't want it. I'm like, the whole thing, even that little nub, that blah, blah, that thing at the end, eat that too. And he's like, oh. And I'm like, oh. And I, for me, like, I got, I started laughing. I was purple. I was squeaking. I was laughing so hard. And he's gagging. He's like, oh. And he choked that lemon down, and when he finally, he's like, oh, well, and, he's, and he gets it, he's like, oh. He long necks it down, he's like, can I have a cookie? <laughs> right? He knew what he wanted, but we jones for things that don't satisfy, and sometimes it's hard to get down things that have, as the British would say, vitamins, things of natural, healthy benefit. There is no greater benefit to your life your purpose, and your well-being than getting to the real food that makes it uncomfortable to be a Christian. Because we believe that Jesus was not just a good man and a good prophet. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He was crucified by his broken body and shed blood. We are Christians. And there is nothing we could do to save ourselves. We are here to confess his all-sustaining salvation work and our participation in receiving it. He is real food. So, temporary food, it satisfies momentarily spiritual gymnastics. I went to church this week, so I think I'm a Christian. No, it's not Christianity going to church. Knowing Jesus Christ is Christianity, is faith. Jesus is not a get out of hell free card. Jesus is the one we seek to know and the one we seek to become like. And by the presence of the Holy Spirit, after we become Christians, the Holy Spirit invades our lives and we begin to live for him, not for ourselves. And we're no longer satisfied with the temporary things of this world. Our life takes on eternal purpose. How do we know Jesus Christ is the bread of life? We know this because even he spoke of the bread of life going forward for the church at the very first communion, but he also spoke of in John 6 the manna in the wilderness, the food that came down from heaven that God provided. And what it did is it revealed something, that the Jewish people received the food of God for 40 years in the wilderness and they had a sacrifice system and they had to go back and get it every day and they had to do sacrifices every on their calendar and their religious activity to stay right with God and they could not fix what was broken. And I want to tell you something today that is the best news you'll ever hear. You can't fix what's broken in here, but he did. And the only way we're going to get to participate with it is recognizing the difficult tr teaching that it is by his life that we come alive, not our own. You are not so gifted that God needs you. You are just so loved that he died for you. And that's a big difference. We recognize that this is strengthening unto life eternal. And that eternal life begins right here and right now. You can't fix what's broken inside of you, but he did. So how now? Do we engage Jesus? How do we engage Jesus? Well, let's go back to that open field where he put people in groups and he fed them. Let's go back to the table that Jesus set. And remember that he cared for people physically, but the next day he cared for them spiritually. And that's what we're going to do today. Today we're going to turn our hearts away from religious practice and towards a table where Jesus Christ engages us as he is, and we are invited to come as we are. Anybody remember the Billy Graham Crusades? If you're old enough to remember, those are so legit. Um, but Billy Graham would have this, these, these evangelistic crusades, and then um, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a guy who would get up and sing, Just As I Am, I Come. I invite you today to come as you are. Not because you have it together, but because you need the one who does have it together, the one who did win the battle, the one who is Lord of your life. Or maybe he's not even yet your Savior, but I invite you to receive him who says, come as you are, messy as you are, and allow me to be the God who provides for you 
life eternal, perspective beyond the immediate, a purpose that lasts and cannot fade. Come to me, all you who are weary, are the words of Jesus. So today we pivot towards the table, towards the table where Christ invited his disciples. And that's what I do for you today. Our application is simple. It is going to be to come to the table and receive that which strengthens us to life eternal. Because this meal that we're about to eat, this meal is a feast. It's, it's just this little portion. It's participant in its activity, but it's a small foretaste of the feast we will have. And it is a feast of remembrance, a feast of communion, conversation, intimate connection, and a feast of hope. We come here today to remember that Jesus Christ was sent into this world, the Son of God, sent into this world by our Heavenly Father to fulfill all obedience to the divine law. Remember that they couldn't fix themselves. And in fulfilling all obedience, Christ was crucified as a criminal. But in his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension, he secured for you and for me an eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation by which none of us would be rejected and all of us would be welcomed. We are all welcomed to the table of Christ on his terms, that his body and his blood are the life that lives in us. We come here to have communion or to, con- to converse, to be close with, to have relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ promised that relationship to us when he said to his disciples, I will never leave you, not even to the end of the age. And I guarantee you the age has not yet ended. He would be with us always. So the bread which he broke strengthens us unto life eternal. The cup which he pours reminds us, as in John 15, that he is the true vine in whom we are to abide if our life is to have any fruitfulness for the kingdom. You see, we come here today with this relationship to this table because we need hope. Hope that we don't have to perform a religious function that makes us okay, but hope that Jesus Christ is participant in our salvation as the Savior and inviting us to let him be the Lord. We come here today with this small taste, this small pledge, this small foretaste to recognize that one day heaven will throw a party and it will change everything. All the saints of all generations will gather around the Lamb and we will finally one day get to see him who is our Lord and Savior. And not only that, we will be made like unto him. But we don't do this alone. We gather as a community at the table today because that's how it's always been done. In a community around the table of Christ, inviting people to redemption's hope that Christ died for you as he died for me, so that we could live for him as he lived for us. My friends, today is World Communion Sunday. Christians all around the world are gathering at the table. They're scattered globally like they were that day on the hillsides of Judea, and you are invited, the people of God, to partake in that which gives purpose and life to the lives you live. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would bless what we're about to do by making your Holy Spirit present among us and felt among us. Move and work as you will and guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. My friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he picked up a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body. It's been broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, Jesus took the cup, and after pouring it, he blessed it. And he said to his disciples, this is the New Testament. It is written in my blood, as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. We recognize that in communion, we are invited to participate in the most foundational and fundamental confession of Christianity that Jesus gave us by his blood and by his broken body, 
We are no longer our own. Our past is redeemed. Our future is purposeful in one name, that of Jesus Christ. The good news is this, that you can't fix it, but he did. And the great news is this, is that he didn't just say, it's all good, see you in heaven. He said he'd be with us. He said he would give us purpose and he would help us live today like it's for eternity. So that's my challenge to you. Because your life is consecrated to God. And it is meant to be a life that exudes grace. You, the people of God, consecrated to him to be his people now and evermore. So in your sitting down at the dinner table, it's consecrated to God. And you're going to work, going to school, living, driving, eating, playing, having life. It's consecrated to God. And everything you do is called to give witness and, and life to the world around you. Witness to Christ and life through him. And it's not an easy life. It is a life where we are called to take up a cross. But oh, what purpose when the church finds out that their life is found in him and lived through him. So I invite you to leave this place and go and live in the power of the one who could fix it, who did fix it, and called you his own. And as you do so, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, it is time for the church to leave the building. You are.